So our first session today is called Starting with Success, and we're going to have a few speakers that will present some case studies of um, their experiences with what we've thought of as successful um, solar plus storage procurements. Um, I think each speaker will, pro will probably present for around 10 minutes, and then we'll want to leave some time open after each one for um, people to ask questions. So please feel free to enter questions in the chat as the presentations are going on or just save them until the uh, time slots uh, after the each presentation. So uh, we have Bob Gibson, who's a consultant for NRECA, who's going to start us off here. And then after that will be John Lemire from uh, the North Carolina Electric Cooperatives. Uh, we also have Laura Kaspari from uh, NG coming in. It seems like uh, she's not here yet, but she uh, uh, texted me a second ago to a uh, let us know she'll um, be popping on um, when the uh, 11 o'clock mountain hours start. So we should have her um, when it comes time for her session. So uh, yeah, with that, I can uh, turn it over to Bob Gibson, who's going to present some case studies um, from NRECA on uh, successful storage, solar and storage procurements. Thanks, David. Um, so, just let me just start with a little anecdote um, from uh, the late 1990s. I was working on a Department of Energy funded project called, you can go back to the title slide, yeah. The a Department of Energy funded project called Team Up, which was uh, looking at the role of solar photovoltaics in the utility world at a time when solar uh, was not economically viable, but the belief was it could be jump started with, with some experience. And we had utilities all around the country, all types of utilities, working with solar providers of all types, did 80 different deployments, uh, technically very successful applications, uh, all, all, you know, of all, all stripes. We were at a meeting in the, uh, in the state of Washington, it was probably 1999, and um, there was uh, utilities and other stakeholders at the meeting, and a, and a uh, representative of a battery company uh, spoke. And he gave a presentation and I could see really the uh, utilities in particular straightening up on their chairs as he spoke. He talked about uh, his company's battery technology and how they were a year away from a major breakthrough in both performance and price. And while the utilities in the room, those who had been involved in the team up project and had hands on experience had come to see that solar even though the utilities were pretty skeptical about solar, particularly at that time, it really did have value if the price ever got to the right, right point. But battery storage was something they already were familiar with and were comfortable with. And you could see the connection they were making between the idea of if solar comes around, if we have battery storage we can count on, we really have something that might really work in the utility environment. Um, so, you know, time has gone on that uh, whether that breakthrough really happened or not, uh, certainly not in the way perhaps it was presented at that time, but things have continued to evolve. What I'm going to talk about today, looking at some, uh, some case studies that we're doing at NRECA, and again, I'm a consultant with NRECA. I, I worked at NRECA in the past, uh, had a long, long career there as well as with other organizations, but um, I'm now work supporting Jan Allen, who was on our, uh, the, the first session uh, a month ago of this meeting, uh, in looking at some, some case studies of a number of co-ops that are, uh, have some current projects, uh, looking at a variety of use cases. And um, I wanted to note that the intention is to publish this. Uh, this will be published this fall. I'll Folks who are members of NRECA will have access to it. Uh, there's a fair bit of detail. I won't have time today to go into much detail at all. But uh, Jan's intention is to make this a living document that will continue to update these case studies as developments happen, and they are happening all the time, um, and add new, new case studies as we go along. I'd also like to, to note that, um, again, looking a little bit of history, battery storage and co-ops, um, you know, Co-ops actually have a fair bit of experience and even some leadership in the deployment of battery storage. Um, going back, I know in the 1980s, uh, some co-ops are doing projects with EPRI. Um, and in 1991, one of uh, two uh, comp first compressed air storage uh, projects uh, was energized, 1991 in Alabama. 
at uh, the uh, cooperative GT, now called Power South. I believe that continues to provide, provide value. Um, and then projects in uh, Alaska in particular, where, the, where the, uh, the, the immediate need for storage in an environment of a very, um, a, a lot of isolated communities and, and a grid that uh, is a bit fragmented, um, kind of culminated in the, the project that was energized in 2003 in Golden Valley in Fairbanks on that cooperative put a, a nickel cadmium battery uh, storage, 25 uh, megawatts uh, for 15 minute duration to be the bridge between outages, which they have a lot of, and uh, standby generation coming on. At one point in time, I think that was the biggest utility scale battery operating in the world. So it, it, this is not new, uh, co-ops have been leaders, but certainly what is happening today is bringing it to a whole new level. If you go to the next slide, please. So these are the cooperatives that are in the case studies we're doing now on the left. Um, again, we're gonna be adding some more in the near future and there are the five kind of basic use cases. Um, each cooperative kind of, we're focusing on one primary use case, um, but all of them have, are at least looking at other values and probably multiple values. And behind all of them, in so many cases, is resiliency. The idea that the you know, storage combined with other technologies can really add to resiliency. You'll certainly, I'm sure, hear from that from John Lemire in a few minutes, uh, what they're doing in North Carolina. We, we, we do cover a little bit of what their first two microgrids. And uh, really, it's a kind of a rich exploration of the value of, of battery storage for, for cooperatives. OK, next uh, slide. So these are the batteries, uh, battery providers, and a couple of the EPCs that were prominent in these uh, in these initial uh, uh, projects, these ongoing projects. I would note that the projects are relatively small. I think in terms of power rating, the the batteries are 250 kilowatts to uh, two megawatts. Um, some of the projects, uh, the, the cooperative was its own EPC in effect, or worked maybe directly with a battery provider, another provider or work with, uh, with EPCs, a variety of experience. Um, and, uh, and also wanna note that these projects, while they have very much a um, real world application and intent to solve a problem or, or, or take advantage of an opportunity, uh, they are very much still pilot projects. And I think the, uh, the research uh, national research labs are involved in a few of the projects um, very much uh, really testing. So the idea of the, they're learning at all stages from the procurement, from you know, the, the, con the concept of the project, the procurement process, the actual uh, construction and energization of you know, energizing, commissioning these projects. It, it, it's all really part uh, and still a pilot, kind of a real world pilot, if you will. If you go to the next slide. So just a few of the, of the takeaways. Um, you know, uh, uh, the things that they, they found, some of the, the, the co-ops found a little bit of a challenge in finding, uh, finding EPCs who were qualified. Some of that is that they weren't, they didn't understand as well as they will and do now and will in the future, uh, the projects they were undertaking. And there was some disappointment in after putting out an RFI um, where they seem to get a lot of, have a lot of qualified vendors when it came to the responding to the request for proposals, very few came through. Um, I think also similarly, the, there's, a, there's a gap it was over and over in, in, in talking with the cooperatives working on their projects now, a gap in culture and business practice between the co-ops and the battery providers. Um, really kind of looking at the world in, uh, from very different ways and somewhat reminiscent of some of the gaps in communications and perspectives that you, the co-ops found with some of the solar developers they've worked with in the, over the past several years. Uh, projects that had a lot of stakeholders really learned that you really need to take care in defining the roles and responsibilities um, for, um, for all participants to have a greater chance of success. Um, and again, some of that communication, understanding uh, what is commissioning to the battery company is different than what the, with the, the, the cooperative utility is considering commissioning. Um, and in one case, uh, when the, the, by contract, the, the battery provider was doing the commissioning, 
And the co-op waiting asked, well, when is your team going to show up? And they said, well, they're not. This is a virtual commissioning. Well, who's going to actually put the battery together? Who's going to assemble this and get it operating? Well, you are. Um, do we get training on that? No, our technology is changing so fast. We, you know, we, we, if we put a training program together, it would be outdated before we actually executed it. Um, here's a manual and we'll talk, help talk you through it. It ended up working out in the end, but again, it kind of an example of the different expectations. And delays, uh, all the, a lot of the projects, particularly those with more, more ambitious agendas, um, did see de delays. And uh, some of them is from things like permitting, local regulation, even federal regulation in some cases. Um, and just the, you know, kind of learning as you go, it's a slower process. So they really say, expect delays, depending whatever your timeline is, you might even think of doubling it in some cases. Okay, next slide. And then looking at, you know, what they learned, if, you know, going from the installation stage to the fully operational stage, um, definitely not cookie cutter designs, not plug and play, customized, every project is different, is unique. Um, some of the setbacks come from just integrating the battery energy storage systems with the existing utility infrastructure. Problems that took a lot of detective work to figure out why, <laughs> what's happening here? Why, why isn't this working? Um, an essential thing that came up, you know, more in every case, and particularly in some, is the, the, the role of the controller being key, essential, and also the most difficult, the most complex to get it right. Um, to get the right support in some cases from providers, to, to have the right communication protocols. Uh, coming up with, a, with the, the correct uh, algorithm, some very complex. Um, for a small a cooperative, it's doable, but it takes a lot of work, particularly if you have an ambitious um, uh, expectation for what the project's going to, the value it's going to deliver to you, and how automated it's going to be as opposed to manually operated. But the good news, overall, very much of a sense of harmony between the battery providers and the cooperatives. They, even though they came from different worlds, uh, spoke different languages, uh, in some cases, uh, they actually worked well together. And um, the battery providers particularly didn't seem to understand things like the value of uh, or the use of peak shaving. Uh, they had more of maybe expectation from working with commercial customers rather than utilities. Uh, but they found that they could they could develop harmonious partnerships. And my final slide, if you'll go to that, that's really just looking. You know, have expectations been 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 overstated, or you know, um, you know, there's been uh, there's oh through any technology, you know, uh, sequences and development. There's all kinds of there's the flavor of the month, and things have been hyped, and um, certainly we've seen lots and lots of different battery chemistries come and go. Some are gonna be just the thing for utilities, uh, let's say the sodium sulfur batteries, uh, great expectations for flow batteries. Uh, you know, the projects we have now are all in the lithium ion chemistry area. Um, even that advanced lead acid, which I think what that battery company back in 1999 was talking about when they talked about their technology development. You know, these things have, um, we've gone through the different stages and, and, and it continues to evolve. But basically, um, if you understand that these are learning laboratories, the technology today, the battery technology today does work. And it is, the co-ops are finding, it does deliver the expected results. Um, it is a co-op friendly technology. Uh, it takes, uh, you know, there's a learning curve, uh, but it can be done. And I, I was, I'll just close with one observation. The residential behind the meter application, which we had, which is um, uh, the most ambitious, perhaps. And if you read the report, a report coming out um, this fall, you'll see the at great detail, the issues and problems and challenges to be overcome at every stage, how you uh, cooperative works with its member owners to operate a battery that's located on the member side of the meter. Um, and do it in a way that the economics and the value works for all parties and in the end delivers value to the utility grid uh, in, in that expected. There are many, many, many problems to overcome, many challenges. Yet with that, even with that, the distribution co-ops and the G&T involved in this uh, spoke with um, great confidence in the future of battery storage and the future of 
behind the meter storage as a utility asset, as something they can do with their members in the future. Economics might not be here today, but they believe that it really is a way, has, is a dynamic way to deliver a lot of value to the grid and, and to the members in the future. Um, so I will close with that and let us go on to the next speaker. Thanks very much. All right, so um, I think before we move on to John, uh, does anyone have any immediate questions that they'd like to ask Bob? Uh, we can always come back at, towards the end of the session to have more general discussion. Um, but uh, if, if anything jump, jumped off the top of anyone's head that they'd like to ask Bob right now, uh, go ahead. Okay. I have a quick question. You mentioned um, delays, which that's my experience as well. <laughs> but my question was, you said you could expect to sometimes even double it. I guess by, I'm assuming doubling would come with the most ambitious schedules. When you mentioned ambitious schedules, what does that mean to you in your experience? I think it's where um, you're, you're, you, you, you're, you're trying to, uh, the project itself, what it's trying to do, what it's, the elements is trying to pull together. If it's solar and storage, plus it's asset deferral, um, plus you're working with, um, you, you have to get approvals at the county level, at the state level, the federal level. Um, you maybe your EPC had to change out project managers two or three times during the course of the project. These are all things I'm drawing from a, a real life example. And that's where, and, and of course the co-op is frustrated. The co-op is learning. They're realizing, oh, if we'd only thought this ahead, we would have done X. We would have gotten this uh, land use approval ahead of time or, you know, so they're all learning. And it's that kind of most complex project where um, one of the co-ops involved in that particular project said, I'd recommend anybody take your projected timeline you have in the beginning of the project and double it. Now that's not the case in every one of them. There's one of the other projects, they had their timeline actually came in under time, but it was a simpler project, less ambitious, more straightforward. They were trying to, they weren't trying to bite off quite as much. Uh, so I guess that that's where that came from. Sure, thanks. All right, um, well, uh, we, uh, now we're going to move on to John Lemire, who's our next speaker. He's the Director of Grid Management at uh, North uh, NCEMC, or North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives, uh, GNT utility uh, that serves uh, electric cooperatives in North Carolina. So. All right, thanks, David. Um, thanks for letting me come and speak to everybody. Uh, I've got a couple slides to run through, but want to talk about um, what what the North Carolina co-ops are doing on, on solar and battery. And then as Jill was mentioning, I'm going to dabble on the microgrids because I actually got to manage one of the microgrid projects that we've done and, and my team uh, is working on the project. So if we could go to the next slide, a couple of things I want to talk about who are the North Carolina electric cooperatives talk about our microgrid and our solar plus storage projects, and then our next step and our kind of bigger vision on what we're doing with our distribution operator and our virtual power plant. So, so we've talked about, and you heard in my introduction, the North Carolina Electric Cooperatives, NCEMC is the generation and transmission cooperative for the 26 distribution cooperatives in the state. Um, we have a, a mixture of full and partial requirements cooperatives, but as you can see from, from this map, the cooperatives are, are spread all across the state in 93 of our 100 counties, and, and we uh, estimate about a, a million households and businesses are served by the cooperatives. Um, this is broken out uh, in the relationship from the investor-owned utility to, to the GNT. There are three IOUs that cover this territory. So from a power supply perspective, managing the power supply and all the different contracts, as you can imagine, is, is quite interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So we have for several years now embarked on projects, um, started with microgrids and pilots. Bob was talking about uh, in their report, you, you saw that the North Carolina cooperatives uh, were in there. Our Ochre Cook Island microgrid and our Butler Farms microgrid. 
um, were our two pilot projects, and, and we did those full turnkey EPCs. Um, we used PowerSecure, uh, so very successful projects. We, we partnered with EPRI to work on controller design because we wanted to do these kind of cradle to grave, so to speak, but we needed help on control architecture. And, and I heard several of you talking about that, that control architecture and what does that mean? Um, I have some links on here. I imagine the slides will be shared out, but if not, we've put together some fact sheets on what we're doing with our solar plus storage and our, our resilient communities and our microgrids uh, that I hope you'll take a look at. But we've actually taken and gone from pilot to what I'll call a commercial offering for our membership. You can see uh, the Roseacre Farms is another agriculture microgrid. Eagle Chase is a resilient uh, neighborhood. And, and Heron's Nest, we just recently commissioned, it's a, uh, I'll call environmentally friendly neighborhood of homes um, that we've done a microgrid. And Jill kind of touched on in our small group, you know, you can take these solar plus storage projects and with more engineering, more analysis, technical screenings, um, you can turn a solar plus storage project into a microgrid. And that's actually what we're doing at Roseacre Farms. Uh, we have a agriculture facility who is looking to meet some of the sustainability goals of an upstream provider. And so the cooperatives are locating a solar plus battery project on their campus and we're exchanging uh, land lease and, and payment infrastructure. But then we partnered with the cooperative and said, well, what happens if we can take this boundary and expand and turn this solar plus storage into a microgrid and then get into value stacks like uh, diesel fuel uh, deferment or, or helping with res reliability and resiliency of, of energy to, to the facilities. Uh, my team is currently working on a portfolio of solar plus battery projects. We've got 10 sites, and those range from half a megawatt to uh, with a 1.1 megawatt hour battery, all the way up to a five megawatt, 10 megawatt hour battery. So those are uh, quite interesting. We, we started five sites, what I, I'll call Greenfield, where we worked with the members to find property that's in the cooperative membership owned by members of the distribution cooperative and, and do land leases. And, and then along the way, our, our portfolio management group had the opportunity to acquire five solar farms that were not yet built. And so in the midst of, of working to develop these sites, these five sites, we threw in five acquisition sites and, and re-engineered and sort of retooled those. Now, our team has decided because we have procurement experience from doing the microgrids, um, we're using Tesla batteries. And so NCEMC procured the batteries for these sites um, with Tesla directly. Now our EPC that we're using is gonna handle the coordinated shipping of the batteries to the sites. Um, NCEMC, I do wanna step back. Um, we're not doing the solar plus storage sites alone. Uh, Y'all may or may not have heard of NRCO, the National Renewables Cooperative Organization. So they are a cooperative owned by, by the cooperatives um, as part of the ACES power marketing, but they are helping us with procurement and, and permitting and sort of helping us with overall project management. Um, I would say our staff is more comfortable in the interconnection uh, realm, um, and we do have somebody that has project management experience, but a lot of the permitting, the, the panel uh, acquisitions and things like that um, are what NRCO is really helping us with. Um, I'll talk a little bit, I, I heard some things in, in the discussion I'll, I'll kind of go back on, but if, if we'll go to the next slide, and uh, I know this says microgrids, but we really see the use case and the value stack, not only for solar plus storage, but, but also for the microgrids. Um, because of those power suppliers and those power contracts that, that I talked about, clearly, you know, capacity demand savings each month is, is the big key, right, on um, how you get payback on these sites. Um, but we're really holistically looking with the membership on these ancillary services. So you've got a or how can you provide reactive 
stability voltage support on the grid uh, and use these assets um, to provide the benefit to the distribution grid. Uh, I touched on the resiliency and the reliability, but that's, that's big for us, especially in the coastal areas uh, with hurricanes and, and with North Carolina having named a uh, resilient um, cabinet position in, in the state government. Um, we see that if we can take projects that we're already working on and create or, or tailor them to a resiliency uh, benefit, that there's a lot of obvious uh, positive, not only PR, but the, 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 the benefit to the membership. Um, and while we've not picked a project, obviously, you know, asset deferral, uh, if you can place batteries and use them to defer assets, not, not having to upgrade transformers, Clearly, there's, there's a value there. Um, if we go to the final slide, um, we are building out a distribution operator environment. And so us as the distribution cooperatives with managing a portfolio of resources that are on the distribution system, both from generation and demand uh, reduction, we're, we're working with OETI, building out a DERMS, a distributed energy resource management system so that we can aggregate for visibility, but also for control and, and operate these, these distribution assets across these cooperatives in, in a single uh, orchestrated manner. But we're doing that in collaboration with our upstream transmission providers, both from a visibility standpoint, but also to show them the value of these distribution assets, much like they see on their distribution systems. Um, so that we can say, hey, if you need it during times of emergency, we have this portfolio of resources that can be acted on to, to benefit the system. Um, so that's, that's exciting. That's taking place in my team as well. And we have completed a uh, test with PJM and have published on our website our, our um, report from this distribution operator pilot and we are working with Duke to, to uh, do a pilot later in the fall. Um, what I wanna to touch on is some of the lessons that we've learned and what I heard from the group. Talking about procurement, you know, we uh, did the ITC safe harbor for our solar panels, but our panels are being manufactured overseas. Um, and you can imagine both uh, from logistics with COVID but also uh, apparently our, our vendor changed something in their process, which changed the UL uh, certification of our panels. And so we are still going through manufacturing certification of panels, getting them shipped over to the US, having to clear through customs and then being sent out to the site. Um, our batteries with Tesla, we procured those. Uh, and, and our shipping time came up and, and we made it through them shutting down the gigafactory due to COVID and starting back up. But we've had to store those batteries in a warehouse uh, because our EPC is not quite ready for the batteries yet. Um, land leases and, and permitting, you know, talking about the timeline. I was chuckling as, as Robert was talking about the timelines. We, we've set out timelines and we've adjusted accordingly on these projects, um, we kind of started and said, let's go. And we were still negotiating land leases. Now on future projects, we've said we want, as we bring in portfolio of projects to build in future classifications, we've said to our members, let's work ahead of time to get these land leases, because clearly land leases uh, take a lot of time, especially when they're member owners of, of the co-op. And uh, so we're working to get those leases ahead of when we hand those over to our project management team to, to get moving. Um, the good thing is that, that our, our, our EPCs that we have on board as far as construction goes, we've not really had any issues with physical construction. They, they've maintained safe working protocols as you would expect and the construction itself is, is coming along really nicely. Um, our, our, Acquisition projects, we're hoping to have those turned on probably in the next two months. 
whereas our greenfield sites were looking probably the first couple months of 21. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, love to have any questions from the group on, on anything that I've said or just anything that you might, might think of. Well, this is David again. Uh, so, so John, uh, my impression was that you had some projects that you had worked on with NRCO and then some projects that you hadn't. Uh, if the, is, if that, is that correct? And uh, that's right. So, so our, our solar plus battery projects and our what we call community solar, so our standalone solar, are projects that we've worked on with NRCO. Our, our microgrids um, projects we worked on with other vendors. Okay. Um, so I guess like with following from that, uh, do you have uh, any idea of like advantages and disadvantages for working with uh, NRCO or a large organization like that versus handling uh, things more in-house? So the, the benefit that we have seen working with NRCO, and I'm, I'm certain it's like working with other developers, is they have more development experience than we do. And clearly we are in the power supply uh, realm, not so much project development. And, and so, you know, for example, our microgrid projects, when we partnered with Power Secure, uh, you know, they're now owned by a Southern company, but they've got a lot of microgrid experience. And so we partnered with them as an EPC to leverage that experience for design and construction. Same with NRCO, we are uh, more, I guess I would say that they are in a project management slash advisory role, helping us through financing, helping us, you know, get um, permitting, helping us get an EPC lined up. And so they are more uh, in, a, in a partnership development relationship with us um, where we are using a lot of our staff's time and resources as well on development and coordination. John, I'd like to dig into that just a little bit more while we're here. Um, so in picturing that relationship, and I know we, we, we had invited Todd, he had a conflict, he's your, your um, project liaison at NRCO, but um, I assume you brought the project idea to them and then do they have preferred financing mechanisms and preferred sources for um, identifying uh, development partners or, or in other words, who's driving that process and how do you work out the balance with NRCO? Yeah, so I think it came so I, I came into my role, I've been in my role for about a year, but I came into my role after we had started these solar plus uh, storage projects. But I think that the roles are defined when we first sit down. I think we came to them and said, hey, we did community solar with you. We now wanna do solar plus storage. And then so we kind of sat down and, and my understanding is the team went through like a RASCI of who, who was gonna be responsible, who was gonna be supportive. And uh, for example, we, they, they've helped us with financing, but we've also steered the ship towards who, who the lender is that we wanna use and ultimately settle with um, because we use them as a lender for other things. Um, like I mentioned, we, we, because we did the microgrid and we used Tesla, NC EMC went out and, and they get said, hey, for batteries, you know, here's a list of vendors that we think you should consider using. We said, well, we're going to go with Tesla because we've used them before, we're comfortable with them, and they gave us a great price. Um, but then things on solar related, like what are the inverters or like the EPC that we're getting to build these sites, they led more of the discussion because they had more experience in sourcing and, and doing material acquisition, but then also that EPC. So it's really been a good partnership and I think it's it's give and take on the, the discussion based on what we feel comfortable or we uh, 
inverters, for example, they said, well, we would recommend going with any one of these three companies. And we said, well, on our other sites, we have this company. So from an O&M and a maintenance standpoint in operations, we want to go with these inverters so that all of our sites have the same inverters. So that's just the type of balance that we've had in our discussion. And that's actually a great little tip too. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, for example, our team has uh, experience in, in SCADA and control design schemes because of our microgrids. And so while we sat down and we mapped out how we want the control scheme to look, you know, our EPC's vendor is taking that and they're going to turn that into a reality. But we're, we're kind of heavy handed on the controls because we have experience and we know what we want the look and feel to look like. Whereas others may just take what the vendor has. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, John. And so now our final speaker for this session is going to be Laura Kaspari, who's the Vice President of Origination at Inji. And uh, she's going to give us some um, um, insights from the provider's perspective on uh, uh, some successful procurements for energy storage. Hi, hey guys. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, do you have the slide, David? Okay, great, awesome. All right, so my name is Laura Casperi. I'm Vice President of Origination at Engie. So we're a, a, a large IPP. Um, I manage our origination team for wind, solar, and energy storage um, across the US and Canada. Next slide. Sorry, next one. Okay. So NG is uh, operating in over 40 countries and we have 160,000 employees, so a very large uh, organization. In the United States, we have about 6,000 uh, employees and with, our aim is to do about two gigawatts of renewables annually, including storage. And I've done personally a couple of dozen co-op solar and storage projects, mostly just solar, but some also storage as well. Um, we're also NRTC, if you know those folks, partner in uh, co-op solar and storage. So I'm going to talk today about a handful of successful procurements and projects we've been part of and focus a little bit on how each one was, uh, was uh, how the procurement was managed for each one. Some of them are co-op projects, some of them are other utilities. They're all NG projects because obviously those are ones I can speak to. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Okay, in terms of uh, solar plus storage, this is a two large projects on the island of Guam. So I'm going to start by discussion with a couple of uh, island projects where some of these interesting uh, storage uh, plus solar plus storage uh, structures are being done now um, and pioneered and then I'm going to talk about mainland projects after that. So these two are designed for 100% time shift. So the energy from the solar panels does not go into the grid at all. It all goes into the battery 100%. And then uh, that's just the time shift so that they, when their peak happens in the evening, they'll discharge the batteries at that time. Uh, it's a DC coupled system, which is efficient for that kind of 100% time shift. For most applications, I'd usually recommend an AC coupled system because that gives you more flexibility to charge the batteries from the grid should you want to. Um, but this, this case, it made sense for this utility. It's also able to black start so it can come online even if the grid is down. And this particular procurement process was run by the utility. Uh, it took them multiple years. It's been a very uh, lengthy prescriptive process. Um, they are regulated, so that's a big difference with most co-ops. So it was a very uh, detailed process. They, they had a couple of rounds, the first round where they kind of qualified a half a dozen or so bidders, and then a second round where they ultimately chose NG. So um, it's an interesting, uh, couple of projects that are also on military land, so you can imagine the complexity that that adds. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions at any point along the way too, before we go on to the next, uh, next slide. Great. So somewhat similar uh, situation here, this one's on Hawaii. So you may know that the Hawaiian electric companies are uh, pioneering in a lot of ways they're going for a 100% clean energy mandate for the islands and so they're 
you know, they're learning a lot earlier than a lot of utilities need to uh, in the US. And obviously they're trying to avoid the high cost of imported fuel. So this is a similar project. It's a, again, 60 megawatts of PV. It's a 240 megawatt hour um, battery. I should say that all the batteries I'm talking about and all the batteries we're currently doing in NG are lithium ion. I mean, that's 99% of the market. So it may not be that way forever, but that's the case for what we're talking about today. Um, this one, uh, this particular procurement was uh, run by the utility as well. They actually ended up selecting 16 or 17 projects. So it was a really heavy lift for that utility to, to so actually go, going out looking for 900 megawatts. Ultimately selected a little bit less than that. And so some of the projects they were looking for were grid charge standalone storage, and some were solar plus storage. So they were looking for three different uh, values in their procurement. One was grid charge storage for capacity. Another was fast frequency response and frequency regulation and the regulation. And the one that we did is solar charge storage. So it's a dispatchable uh, solar plant. Um, and so, you know, very complicated, um, very detailed uh, lengthy RFP. Again, they are regulated by of PUC in Hawaii. So that's a, a big influence, influencing factor in how they go about their projects and after selection and PPA negotiation then need to go through that through that process of uh, getting util, uh, commission approval. And so I, I will note that I've noticed over the years the, a difference with, with most co-ops and with IOUs like that and regulated utilities, the flexibility that co-ops have is actually a, a big advantage because you're not subject to that regulatory control and so you can move more flexibly and, and turn things around more quickly and get projects online more quickly. So, um, next slide, please. Okay, so moving to the mainland now, the ANZA project you guys I think have heard of um, perhaps even today is one that's currently under construction with NG right now. So this is uh, a really exciting example of a project where there's a need for resiliency is the kind of value they're looking for there. Um, so this microgrid that the co-op was impacted by California wildfires. Um, they need low voltage ride through capability. It's a solar plus storage um, project with a, with a um, controller to uh, enable it to work in microgrid mode, um, preventing incidents of capacity upgrades. Uh, and so this is uh, the RFP, if I recall correctly, was run by the co-op in this case. And I do have some examples of RFPs that run not by the actual utility coming up. So we can go to the next one. Okay. Uh, this is a, no, there's no solar in this, this project. This is just the battery uh, that United Power, we installed for United Power in 2018 or 19. I can't remember which right now. I think it was 2019. Two projects, uh, the larger of them. This is 16 megawatt hours for our duration. And, and this is, you know, for peak reduction, which is almost every solar plus storage or standalone storage project that I've talked to a co-op about, and there are many, it's about peak reduction. So, um, next slide. Okay, this one's a municipal utility project we did in the Northeast. What was, to me, what was really interesting about this project is on a, a former, a site of former coal plant, um, decommissioned uh, land. So it's a brownfield site that we had a, a solar project on and we added a, a battery again for the uh, uh, peak reduction. Next slide. Okay, I'm not allowed to name these utilities yet because they aren't public, but I'll tell you one of them is a co-op. Uh, you can see the NRCO's name there. So they ran that particular RFP uh, in New England and these batteries are both operating in ISO New England markets. So we're stacking the values of not just, you know, the, the co-op who is interested in peak demand reduction, but also uh, wholesale participation in the ISO New England market. And so what was interesting about that NOCO RFP is the uh, co-op initially wasn't looking for this kind of partnership and perhaps hadn't been thought about, this hadn't been thought about perhaps our team has been very active in, in New England and so we're very familiar with ISO New England and we're able to do a shared uh, savings model in that, which works in that particular um, ISO 
where we're providing services and we're accessing uh, revenues from the battery when the co-op's not using it. So there'll be more to come on that one that's um, really interesting and, and a good process run by NERCO. We had a great dialogue starting with what co-op thought they were looking for and then we ended up actually through that dialogue coming up with this different shared savings model that works for both parties. It was really interesting and, and well run. And the other uh, RFP is also run by, by the utility in that case in a, a similar kind of uh, setup. Uh, next slide. It might be the last example. Yeah, I think that's the last one. I think that's the okay, slide, great. Yeah. So um, I'm speaking tomorrow about some of the kind of uh, things to look out for and other things in procurement that I want to like get too much into the detail of what I plan to talk about tomorrow. So today I just really wanted to highlight those particular uh, success stories um, and then open up any questions about any of those subjects. Uh, Laura, I had a question just to kick things off. Um, this is Katie Signer with RMI. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the um, process with the, the New England co-op and then the utility where um, through the procurement process, it sounds like the um, use case for the battery changed and like how common that is and what um, aspect of the negotiation allowed for that kind of dialogue and flexibility to happen throughout the, the process. Yeah, so if I recall correctly, the initial uh, plan was for it to be an EPC project. So we would provide the battery, build the project, battery, turn it over, and the co-op would operate it in the market. Um, but as it happened, because that's in Iceland, New England, it's a pretty developed uh, merchant market for storage more so than, than most places. NG just happened to have been doing dozens of other projects in that market. So we really understood well. And we also had acquired uh, a group that operates um, batteries and, and other energy uh, systems in ISO New England called Genbright. So we just happened to really deeply know that market more than others. And there were more, more opportunities for different value streams in that market. So as the discussion unfolded, we said, okay, you know, you think about what, what, what can each party bring to the table and what reflects their strengths and, and brings the most value to the co-op. And in some other markets and, and in some of the other examples illustrate, it probably would have been, you know, fine for us to just give them a basic battery and have the co-op operate that battery. But because we have a, a trading desk and, and people with the right skills to operate in that particular merchant market, we said, okay, we understand what you want to do with this, with this, this battery, these peaks you want to hit we can guarantee you hitting those peaks, but you should let us also, you know, share the use of that battery for certain, under certain conditions, certain hours um, to operate in these ancillary markets, we can have shared revenues and, and bring down the cost over all of the battery. I think that's something that we can see in the future in PJM and other markets. It's a sort of something that where the market was further developed and further along in ISO New England right now. And so we'd had other experiences of being able to do that there. So it's, it's a good example of, um, sometimes the, the co-op thinks they know what they want and sometimes they're absolutely right about that. And sometimes through dialogue, you can uncover actually there's, this, you know, talking to the, to the experts in the field, there are other things you can do that are interesting and, you know, brought to bring to the table um, uh, a different use case or a broader uh, opportunity. So, uh, so I think earlier uh, Bob had mentioned that sometimes there's uh, the uh, provider teams and the co-op teams, I think the term he used was speak different languages. I'm not sure how literal that was in every case, although I imagine sometimes it is. Um, but I guess I, I, for uh, you, Laura, I wanna uh, touch in on um, the, your perspective on that and if you, uh, any communication issues or terminology issues you had in working with the co-ops, especially since we, I think we've had uh, some of these projects, we, we have people from both sides of the actual project here today. So if we want to have any discussion on that from others, please jump in. Yeah, and I've been working with co-ops for more than five years on these projects and talking to them on a weekly basis. And I think I've, you know, and with our partnership with NRTC, we've gotten really used to, you know, that, the co-op world and, you know, how they how they think and what they what the values they're looking for for projects are. Um, and so to me, it's, it's, it's a pretty standard thing, but when I'm bringing in, you know, other colleagues who are working on other projects, I feel like I'm often in the role of sort of translating a little bit. Um, some of the, you know, 
uh, expectations and, you know, a lot of, of uh, people on the selling side of things are used to dealing with uh, utilities who uh, maybe more at the G&T level or an IOU who are used to procuring generation. A lot of distribution co-ops aren't uh, as often in the seat of you know, procuring ge generation, which they are starting to do now for these smaller projects. And so that's um, new to them. And so there's a certain amount of kind of understanding that paradigm that needs to go on. Uh, or they used to, you know, a certain type of generation and that's quite different to what we're doing here or, you know, just build, building your own coal plants, things like that. Um, and, and making sure that, you know, there's, there's a dialogue about how these projects are developed um, and, you know, going to bring it down to that right level. Because sometimes it's second nature for someone who's developing, say, a solar project to know, okay, well, you need a land lease for 35 years because that's a useful life of the equipment. And, you know, that to get a finance, you need, you know, this particular amount of years. A co-op might say, okay, I'm doing a 25-year PPA, I get it, better get a 25-year year land lease, and you're talking kind of past each other. And so what I try to do is sort of bring it down and bring, um, bring things down to a common sort of level of understanding and explain things um, that may seem second nature to us and not to use too many acronyms. I've started to get quite frustrated about it. It's always been part of the industry, but I feel like lately we've started to use so many acronyms that they're losing their value and they're actually making things far more confusing. Trying to avoid that a little bit, I think is good too. I wanted to turn that question to Bob Gibson too. Um, as you've worked with a, a large number of co-ops on this in, uh, in terms of the communications and language, have you uh, at NRECA or through NRECA uh, done anything with trying to, uh, you know, provide a common glossary or, and, and that's not just for the co-ops, but I think the question is how do you take that common glossary that you have, you know, kind of encouraged the co-ops to use and encourage the industry guys to use the same one or at least to get together with you to make a common language? Jill, that's a brilliant idea. I'm going to I'm going to suggest that to my <laughs> colleagues at NRECA because it I think it, perhaps the time is right for that. That's 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 a good idea. And 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 as co-ops get working with other um, like there's been mentioned and and Laura just mentioned the example of like working with the Navy base. Got a number of co-ops working providing an expanding array of energy services to military bases that they they serve or they bid on and won a contract and i mean just there the 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 the, the, the um expectations uh, glossary for that would be would be very useful so that's that's a great idea i wonder if any of the co-ops that are on the call have had an experience of working directly with um a storage developer or solar plus storage developer um, and then perhaps working through an agent you know some kind of representative whether that's NRCO or NRTC or a G&T and I would imagine that there's a, a trade-off there that there's a benefit to the positive of direct feedback that you get but also the extra time that it takes maybe or the expertise that you don't have so I, I don't know if anyone else on the call would be willing to weigh in on the pros and cons of working directly with the developer versus working through some kind of agent and John Lamar I guess you you're the first target because you've done it both ways yeah I mean so for us it's a balance of you know, because co-ops are small shops. And, and so it's having somebody doing things on your behalf to help you manage staffing. But it's also a balance of with us, because we're going to do more of these in the future, we want staff to learn alongside with who we're partnering with to develop so that we can do them next time. That doesn't mean that we're going to ever replace the partner that we're working with. But I think for us, it's it's a mixture of, of of the two things there. And, and, and I think because of our past experience with with NRCO um, and the fact that they have their development staff, that's why we we sort of jumped in, and that's how we chose what we did. 
And David, I know you have something else to switch to, but I wanted to spend just a second asking Laura to explain one, one other thing. We, um, another person that we want to get a conversation going with um, would, would be possibly MJ Shawit at uh, NRTC. It, could you just very briefly uh, describe that relationship? Because I think it's new, isn't it, that, that uh, MG is working with NRTC? We've been doing that for five or six years. Oh, okay. And, and how yeah. does that work? Yeah, so N uh, NRTC is a um, technology provider to co-ops. And so most co-ops in the U.S. are members of NRTC. They were formed by NRECA a long time ago. And, you know, they have regional business managers who go out and provide services to uh, pr provide, uh, uh, you know, share, that, share the, the services that they provide to co-ops in, in their offices. And, you know, there was a lot of demand from, for, from NRTC uh, about six years ago uh, to help uh, co-ops understand uh, solar and obviously later storage. And so they ran a, a competitive process where they uh, solicited a couple of dozen developers to provide their credentials and, and NGO at the time, SoCore Energy, which is now since a couple of years ago acquired by NG, uh, was was chosen and I joined SoCore right around the same time. So we're their exclusive provider for solar and storage and they go out to co-ops and, you know, as part of their offering, help, help answer questions about uh, uh, about renewable energy and storage and, and bring me or one of my colleagues in, usually me, uh, where appropriate to help those conversations. And we've, we've done about 100 megawatts of solar together in the last few years. Um, and I just wanted to jump in. I noticed, Tim, you unmuted yourself um, in response to Jill's previous question. So wondering if you had anything to share there. Yeah, I was just going to make a couple comments. So uh, with us being a bit larger cooperative, things not necessarily with our g and where we do things on our own. Um, but I will say, I feel like this project we're doing with the battery and solar, um, we're probably a little ahead of our, our G&T family of company. And we've certainly had conversations with them on, on battery over the years. But, um, but we did use Green Power EMC, which is the um, renewable cooperative made up of the 38 co-ops in Georgia. And, and folks from there were, in the beginning, we used them a lot with some of the analysis and, um, and their expertise in some of the projects that they've, they've been involved in. Um, so that was, that was my input, I was gonna say. I guess a follow-up question to that, I, I, I guess would, would be to Aaron and, and John from Kate Carson, as, as your co-op is relatively small, um, do you feel like sometimes you're on the front line with uh, you know, with a gorilla because you, you're, you're very small relative to the companies that you're working with to acquire um, solar plus storage. Um, and John, I, I think you were talking about the relationship with your energy provider. I don't know which of you want to take it, but if you could just kind of explain how does a very small co-op work directly with these companies? Uh, I wish I could uh, give you that information. I uh, haven't been here long enough to uh, be able to pass that on. So I, I haven't been here and involved in it. I hope to be more involved going forward, but uh, um, I, I'm not the right person to answer, regretfully. Erin, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think maybe ask us again tomorrow when Luis and Richard will be on the call. That's a very good point. Yes, thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, if, uh, if none of our other participants have any questions right now, I, I had one more, which was um, ask about um, the differences between um, these procurements where um, the utility is going to be the actual owner and operator of the installed project uh, versus procurements that involve um, PPAs or storage as a service agreements. So I wanted to ask all of our speakers, um, first of all, wh whether any of the projects involved in their procurements were storage, uh, storage as a service arrangements, and then if they were, what the differences were. So, so in North Carolina, the only project that we have 
that is is not that that is a PPA based is the Heron's Nest microgrid, and the the neighborhood microgrid developer put in the solar and the battery, and and PPA the project to us, and then through an operating agreement, we we worked out the control and the microgrid aspect, but for all others that we are procuring, we plan to be the, the owner operator. Yeah, I'll, I'll add the majority of the projects that we bid on are PPAs. Uh, sometimes it's a build transfer where the co-op is owning it, but usually the PPA because most co-ops being nonprofits don't have the tax appetite to monetize the tax credits. So usually NG finances the system and does that for them. Happy to do both. Um, and you know, obviously, you need to take it. There's, there's two main themes if you're looking at it, owning a system versus a PPA. A PPA, you know, you need to consider that what what the parts of the project that the co-op has control of. Maybe sometimes it's land, things like that. Uh, that it is going to be financed by a third party, and so you need to think about you know requirements there. Versus if you're going to own the system, then you probably care a lot more as well. You know, it's it's the developers, um, depending on what your PPA says, it's the developers' risk on. A system if they're building and owning it, but if you're going to own it, you have to think differently about risk and, and equipment and things like that as well. And I don't think that Joel is on the phone right now with us, Joel Danforth. Don't see him, but uh, Lorena, we could put you on the spot if um, you could speak to United Power. The the um, the first project, which Laura actually mentioned, your your large battery project. Um, was a direct acquisition, not a PPA. Um, would United Power consider going into a PPA? I mean, just in general, I know you can't speak for the company, but but have you considered doing a PPA structure for either solar or storage or both? Would be a question Joel would have to answer because I have not been in those talks at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, that's all I can right. add the battery. You're here, to, you're here to join the team. So it's, it, you know, I think this is one reason why um, a couple of people, when we said, well, what's one word about procurement? You know, we've got cooperation and, and inclusion, and um, there's a lot of players to bring into a decision process. So. And that particular battery is charged by the grid, so it doesn't have solar associated with it. So there are, at, right now, there are no tax credits associated with it. Um, and so that was one of one of United's United's drivers for not doing a PPA because there wasn't a financial benefit to doing so. So Laura, do you generally recommend? I mean, if people are open to your recommendations, would you generally recommend doing solar plus storage, or are you agnostic about whether they do both? It depends on the situation and what's best for the co-op. You know, if there's not going to be a strong financial case for adding a battery to a solar project, then there's probably, the co-op's probably not going to do it, and that's fine. Um, you know, there's no point in, in spending money on a project unnecessarily. Um, do I think it's a better product and a better solution generally? You know, if you, if you take uh, the exact use case of a co-op out of it, absolutely, uh, of course, it's more dispatchable power, but it's really up to what makes financial sense for the co-op, and do they have you know, really high demand charges, okay, then probably it does make sense. But if if they're not in that kind of situation, you know, then maybe not. It's really just, it's it's not a kind of one answer for all proposition. I often wonder whether the industry as a whole is gearing towards larger and larger projects and whether some of the small locally cited projects will drop off. Um, I guess the one the one case that I would just bring into that thought process is that we do see local projects interested in resilience. Is that the main driver of the trend for local projects or is local demand reduction uh, a major force as well? Or how do you look at the future of locally cited solar plus storage? I don't think we're seeing a ton of projects going in for resiliency reasons just yet. I think it's a very unique uh, use case. And you could you could make a case in either direction that would be more large projects or more small ones. I think both is likely to happen. I think there's avoiding the large cost of transmission upgrades and, and doing locally cited renewables makes a lot of sense. 
Um, but there's also going to be very, you know, good economies of scale coming from large projects. So I think that'll be a, a good place for both. Yeah, well, I think we're at the end of our scheduled time window for this, although our next session is relatively um, open since it's the snacks and chat. I think I saw that Bob had his um, um, microphone unmuted for a few seconds there a couple of minutes ago. I wanted to see if he uh, wanted to jump in on any of those last few questions. Uh, no, that's okay. I think it was covered. Thanks. David.